All right. Thanks for sticking with me while I took a little bit of a break. We are resuming. If you're just joining us, thanks for being here for the very first Live Till We Make It. We've put over 130 videos on this YouTube channel to help professional wrestlers no matter where they are at in their journey, whether they're just starting out in their training phase or they are deep into establishing their long-lasting legacy. We try to cover all the bases here so that everybody finds new ways to challenge themselves, keep growing, and self-improving. And while I was grabbing a drink of water, I know some more questions were coming in. Thank you very much. And thanks for sticking with us. I'm going to try and tackle a few of them now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what advice would you give to someone who feels like they've accomplished everything they're going to in their career? Wow. Okay, so the question is, uh, what advice would I offer to someone who feels as if they have already accomplished everything they are going to in their career? Uh, and I feel that. Uh, I've had moments where I've, I feel that way in my own career. And I guess I will just offer you my experience in that. You must begin to find those things that will give you a sense of creative satisfaction and fulfillment and start to seek those out. They may not seem as lofty as the career goals you set for yourself on day one of training, right? When you knew what your WrestleMania moment was going to look like, or you could imagine exactly what your entrance would be down the rampway at the Tokyo Dome on January 4th, or the exact awkward method you would use to go down those kind of crooked stairs at Arena Mexico for CMLL every Friday night. Eventually you get to a point, and 99% of professional wrestlers will get to this point, where they realize the thing they wanted for themselves on day one is no longer relevant because it's not achievable, uh, because it doesn't matter to them anymore. Less than 1% ever really make it to a major stage. That, that's just the statistics of it. Less than 1%. And if your only career aspiration, if the only way you can feel validated as a professional is that one thing, when it finally comes into view, well, maybe that's not going to be it. Or the goals that you did set for yourself, you have already achieved, then you gotta find a different way to challenge yourself. Otherwise, it might be time to try something else. Seek that creative fulfillment. Seek that personal validation from some other art form. But I do think that wrestling as a craft is so robust, it's so dynamic, that it's just waiting for you to discover some other dusty corner of it and make it your own. Find some other way that you can shine your talents in a different department. And of course, it is the most attractive. It is the most seductive to be on stage. But there are so many other jobs in the world of professional wrestling beyond that, which can be fulfilling, which can be very validating, which give you plenty of room to select new goals and chase them. So I know what it's like to feel like maybe there's nothing left for me to achieve there on stage in front of the paying customers, but that doesn't mean your journey is over yet. You gotta find something else that would mean something to you. And at different points in my career, different things have mattered to me. Um, there have been times when I've taken a great deal of pride in, uh, th there was three years where I consistently prioritized this. I thought, I wanna be the best possible teacher available in pro wrestling. And everything else became a secondary goal to me. Not that these other things weren't important, they still stayed important but nothing could trump that. That was my overarching goal. I wanted to become the best possible teacher in professional wrestling. I needed to go and chase that. Um, was that something I wanted for myself in the first five, seven, eight years of my career? No, that wasn't even on my horizon. Um, but it became increasingly important to me as time went on. I think if you feel like you've achieved everything you are likely to achieve, then start to widen your perspective a little bit. Look into other parts of the pro wrestling art form for places where you could begin to develop, see goals out there, set those markers for yourself, and then go chase them to the very best of your ability. Otherwise, I think you risk, one, stagnating, but two, also drifting into irrelevance. If there isn't anything that you're pushing forward on, that you're aspiring to, that motivates your own self-growth, I think you begin to flirt with obsolescence, and none of us can afford that. What else? Sorry, what is the 60 second rule for entrances, and are there any exemptions to this rule? Thank you. So the question is, what is the 60 second rule for entrances? Um, 
And while I know I cover this in depth in a video on the channel, I want to reprise that answer a bit for you now. Generally speaking, for television programs, the entrances are blocked out to have 60 seconds of time. And these are the most important 60 seconds for you as the performer. You might imagine, well, wouldn't the most important 60 seconds, for example, be the 60 seconds where I'm winning the match with my trademark move? Well, here's why I would argue it is, in fact, your entrance. Because for those 60 seconds, the focus is only on you. The attention of the commentators who narrate the universe need not be divided. That focus can be solely on you. And so your goal must always be to try and fill those 60 seconds to the best of your ability without going over. So, if you're familiar with the game show, I call it Price is Right Rules. Get as close to 60 as possible without going over. The minute you go into second to 61, you're taking a second away from somebody else on the team, from another member of the ensemble. And that's not fair. It's not fair when it happens to you. It's not fair to do it to someone else. So get as close to 60 seconds as possible. Fill that up with whatever it is that you want to transmit to the viewer. Is it an emotional choice that you are making? Is it something that informs character, that engages your three chief theatrical tools, your facial expression, your body language, and your vocalization? Is there a key character trait you must establish in the early going of the performance, which does include the entrances? Entrances are part of act one. It's very, very important that you maximize those 60 seconds and tell as much about your character as possible to whomever happens to be viewing. But there might be those examples where you've been cut for time because television's running too long. The show was timed out incorrectly. They need to cut certain segments and they tell you, you've only got 15 seconds. Great. Show what a polished and versatile performer you are by being able to make those adjustments on the fly and still go to the ring and deliver. Or you might feel like, depending on where you're at in a story, that filling 60 seconds going to the ring isn't appropriate for the emotional content of the match. Uh, having just spent a whole lot of time rewatching WrestleMania 8, I can tell you it's imperative that the Macho Man hustles down to the ring for his match with Ric Flair. If he had not hustled down to the ring, so much of the dramatic tension of the first few moments of that match would have been lost. It was essential to the performance of that heavyweight title match at WrestleMania 8 that Savage came to the ring like a cannonball. So yes, there are some exceptions to that, but those aside, make sure that you maximize those 60 seconds because it's the only minute of the whole show uniquely dedicated to your character. Someone in WWE used a gimmick I'm interested in. Can I put a spin on it and reuse it? Great, so the question is someone in WWE is performing with a gimmick that was of interest to you. Can I still use it by putting my own spin on it? Well, I have two thoughts on that. Number one, anytime you are doing a character that is very similar to one appearing on an international stage, you will constantly draw comparisons to them. And chances are, because they have all kinds of advantages that you don't have, right? They have the best television production in the world behind them. They have a giant billion dollar organization helping get that character over. They have all kinds of advantages like that, that you probably don't have at your beck and call. You will almost always be unfavorably compared to that other version of the character. However, if you were able to do it in a way that highlights the differences between your interpretation and theirs, you may be able to carve out a niche for yourself doing that. But it certainly limits what you're able to do with if that other character is really popular and is appearing on the international stage. It's not impossible, but it's gonna be a real uphill battle for you. The likelihood that you'll be unfavorably compared, if not, sometimes just outright called a copycat, looms large. So consider those factors and weigh them out before you make a decision. What would you do if you're afraid of going back to training after a long injury? Mm. The question is, what do you do if you are afraid to return to training after an injury? And I've come back from more than my share of injuries over the years, so I relate very much to what you were saying. Um, it was right here in this building maybe a year and a half ago that my right arm was pushed out of place and I broke a piece off the end of my elbow bone. Uh, it, it literally happened three feet from where I'm standing. Uh, I'm amazed there isn't a stain on the floor from it. 
Coming back from that was one of the most daunting experiences of my whole career because I felt like I will never be where I was before the injury again. I won't. Uh, physically, I'm already past my prime. I know from looking back on my own matches, my physical prime was when I was 34, 35, and 36 years old. I have my best physical performances in the ring during those three years. Some of that had to do with the Swiss guy that was underneath me making me look good. But I am past that point now. Uh, I feel like I'm trying to cling on to whatever measure of positive physicality I possibly can. Otherwise, I am arriving at a point where I should not occupy a spot on the card. I should relinquish that to the younger talent that might benefit from the stage time more. If I can't contribute in a relevant and meaningful way, do I really belong under the lights anymore? And I was rankled by those kinds of questions while I felt hobbled coming back off my injury. And it took me an enormous amount of time to come back from it. It was the longest amount of physical therapy I ever had to go through. My recovery was slower because, surprise, my body in my 40s is not as resilient as when I was in my 20s. Who'd have thunk it? But it was a game of inches. If I could feel a little bit stronger today than I felt yesterday, I was on that slow path to recovery. If I could do a little bit more tomorrow, than I was able to do today, I am continuing on that path to recovery. Take those small steps and know that on the flip side of any injury, minor or major, you can ease yourself back into the shallow end of the pool before you need to go swimming out into that deep end. You don't have to plunge in head first where the water is 12 feet deep. Ease yourself into the shallow end. Take it one day at a time. Do as much as you can and then just hang back. Eventually, you can build the confidence back up until you feel like you are ready to tackle the most challenging parts of training. But if you try to rush back in, or you plunge into the deep end, unready for the temperature of the pool, it's gonna shock your system. Uh, as a kid, I was on the swimming team for many, many years. And we used to swim before the school day, which meant I was at the school at 6.30 in the morning, diving into an ice cold pool. I know with the shock of that, hitting your body is like. It is super unpleasant. So that metaphor resonates very deeply in my overchlorinated skin. I know exactly what that feels like. Ease back into it. Do only what you feel like you are comfortable doing and take it day by day. You're not gonna show back up 100% ready to take on the world after a serious injury. I've come back from dozens of them and I never have. Um, Chikara is a very specific flavor of ice cream that pairs nicely with flavors uh, people like in other forms of pop culture, but how can you convince fans of those other flavors to check out your flavor? That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is, um, Chikara, of course, is a very unique flavor of ice cream. Uh, that is the flavor I have made the most of in the course of my wrestling career, and it pairs nicely with other forms of pop culture, but how do you get fans of these other forms to try the flavor of ice cream that we're making here in pro wrestling? Um, I have a few thoughts on that. Do I know one perfect answer for that? I don't, but I do have some thoughts I'll share with you on that exact topic. Whenever it's possible to point out those areas of intersection, the commonly shared interests do so. For me, the most commonly intoned one about Chikara is I summarize it as being a live action comic book. It's serialized fiction that we present, except that it's three dimensional. It does not exist on the printed page like a graphic novel does. You come and you interact with it. Uh, there's no comic book that can high five you, but there are absolutely characters in this universe that can tumble right out of the ring and land in your lap. It provides a more dynamic experience that still enjoys all of those same tropes. If you love comic books, if you love graphic novels, if you love the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think there's a darn good chance you may like what we make in this ring. So I try to emphasize the points of intersection so that they can understand where the common ground is. Sometimes that's enough to open up their imaginations if they're closed-minded about pro wrestling as an art form. And when I do interviews and I do podcasts, uh, I, I make this frequent comparison and feel free to rip it off yourself. So I have called venues in years past where we have needed to rent out space to put on a Chikara event. And my first time speaking to a manager there or whoever handles the book, 
they will say something to me like this on the phone call. They'll say, you know, years ago, we had pro wrestling in here, and it's really just not for us. And I go back to the idea of being flavors of ice cream or genres of music. So I will meet that with this. I say something like, well, if you tried pro wrestling just once, and only ever that one flavor, that one genre of wrestling, and decided it's not for you. It is a little like turning on the radio. And in that second, maybe you hear a Beatles song. And you decide based on that one Beatles song that no music is for you. And you stop listening to music for the rest of your life. If you're willing to try a different band, listen to a different song, Maybe change genres. You might like pop, but how do you feel about jazz? How do you feel about bossa nova? How do you feel about hip hop? If you're willing to try another genre of music, if you're at least open to that, try our flavor of wrestling. Maybe you don't like it, but if we don't try, we'll never know. And usually I can open people up at least to the possibility of giving it a try. I can get them to watch a short two minute teaser video that to the best of our ability illustrates exactly what it might be like when we bring our wrestling into their building. Does it always absolutely work out 100% of the time? Of course not, no. I don't have that absolute cure-all for that exact thing, but sometimes I can nudge the boulder just enough to get me to the next phone call, to get me to the next decision maker, to get me to the next phase of getting a date in, the, in that book so that I can bring my flavor of ice cream to a venue that might have made up their mind when they booked ECW in the 90s, they made up their minds that wrestling should never be in this venue again, or whatever other example you want to plug in there. Great question, thank you. What advice would you give to someone who wants to become a pro wrestling promoter? What advice would I give to someone who wants to be a pro wrestling promoter? Um, having fallen into that, almost backwards. It was certainly never a responsibility I wanted for myself. And in the original formation, in the very early days of Chikara, that was not meant to be part, part of my workload. Uh, you may or may not know, in the very early days of Chikara, I had a business partner, the reckless youth, Tom Carter. And our original division of responsibilities, none of that was meant to be in my lap. A lot of the creative stuff, uh, characters, story, that kind of stuff was meant to be my responsibility. And some of the more business ND things were meant to be Tom's responsibility. That is not my wheelhouse. It is certainly not my strength. Uh, taking some business classes, I think, is, should be a prerequisite to that. You've got to come in with a real understanding and knowledge of that if you want to succeed in a major way as a promoter. And, and I don't mind telling you, I don't have that background. Um, it, is, it has been a constant weak point in my overall game. There are a lot of things in pro wrestling I'm very good at. Um, but when it comes to some of the more logistical or math side of the brain type stuff, that's not my forte. It's not my strength. So my first bit of advice to you, I suppose, would be that. Come in with a really well-formulated business plan and never expect that what's going to happen the day of the event is going to get you to the bottom line. Uh, I'll break that down in greater detail for you. I have absolutely worked for pro wrestling promoters who imagined that all the money they would need for the full budget of an event will just magically be made the day of the event, right? All oh, the ticket sales and the merchandise and the concessions, all the chief revenue streams of a live event, tickets, merchandise, and concession will magically equal out exactly to what the budget is so that everyone gets paid. And that's a fool's errand. The likelihood of that happening on the modern independent scene right now, very, very unlikely. Highly unlikely, says Gorilla Monsoon from the great beyond. Highly unlikely. You've got to have that money already taken care of. Make up your envelopes in advance. Make sure if this company, this vendor, this whomever needs to be paid beforehand, get that done. Do not count on the guarantee of the gate because the gate is never a guarantee. If you're walking in thinking that's going to be your saving grace, you're already in trouble. Never put yourself in that kind of hot water. And if going in you have concerns about your ability to even make the budget, look for areas where you can start to cut the budget down so that you are never walking into a disaster like that. Uh, that is a reputation killer. If you make people guarantees in advance and the day of, you've got to go back on your word and say, 
I know I promised you this, and I'm sorry I can't honor my promise to you. Your reputation is already in trouble. Don't set yourself up for those kinds of failures beforehand. If you're interested in exploring becoming a promoter here in the United States, you need to know that some states are still governed by a state athletic commission, and they will issue you either the licensure or the permature that you will need to be able to legally hold pro wrestling events in your state. About half the United States still have active athletic commissions, the other half have deregulated. And it may fall under something else. It might fall under arts and entertainment. You may have a different governing body, but this has undergone a radical change since the days of wrestling being presented as a carnival attraction when it fell underneath gaming commissions. This was because carnivals, which presented games of chance and the opportunity to gamble, right? Even if you're gambling for a prize, you were giving money to compete for that stuffed animal. All that falls under the purview of gaming commissions. When wrestling, in an effort to differentiate itself, said, no, we are legitimate sport, Yes, they got out from underneath the gaming commissions, and guess where they ended up? Underneath the athletic commissions. Is that where we should have ended up? No, no it is not. Because we are entertainment, we are not legitimate sport. But about half the United States still govern it like it is. Like here in my home state of Pennsylvania, where we are governed by the exact same system of rules that govern boxing and MMA. Thanks for your question. Should I be willing to give up my job for wrestling? The question is, should I be willing to give up my job for wrestling? And that's a tough question. Uh, and, and to be fair, the only person that can really answer that is you. What is your goal? Is your goal to make a living in wrestling? If it is, then should you be prepared at some point to give up your job for pro wrestling? I would argue that yes. Yes, you should. If it's not your goal to make a living in professional wrestling, then I think that need not be a concern of yours. And although it had been my goal, to make a living in professional wrestling, that really did not happen until I was in for 13 years. Is that right? Yes, 13 years. August of 2007 is when I left my last nine to five job and professional wrestling became the way that I made a living. And I've had to really diversify for that to be true. Was I able to make a living just by being a performer? No. Um, you may know for 10 years I worked for the London Kappa family of magazines that are sometimes called the Aptor Mags. Uh, I worked as a freelancer for them. I did travelogues. I, had, I was a columnist. I wrote feature pieces for them. I have more than 500 magazine credits uh, in that period of time. I've written now a total of nine books, Toolbox, Building Better Pro Wrestling being number nine, available in the Kindle store today. Uh, I found constant other ways within wrestling to supplement my income because just being a performer has never been enough to pay the bills. I've had to be able to diversify. If that is ultimately your goal, whatever you can do to start preparing for that, great, do that. But I know, at least in my case, it took me 13 years to be able to graduate to that point. And there have been numerous times uh, over the course of the years where I've had to choose to find some other method of income outside of wrestling to help supplement it, whether it was in the short term or in the long term, because oftentimes, and I know this is going to seem impossible given what's going on in the world right now, sometimes wrestling just goes away when you need it the most. Sometimes it is exceptionally difficult to make a living in professional wrestling. To that end, I'm calling on you for some help. You may know that my lecture series has been archived. I have 13 different seminars at the ready for you to watch on demand whenever you would like. And I cover a wide variety of topics in these seminars, from structuring your matches to having a bolder character with a unique differentiating value proposition, to exploring things like tag team wrestling or 155 years of wrestling history. And all 13 of them are archived and available for you at a link that we're gonna drop below and it makes me think of this. Starting right now until next Wednesday, I will offer you this special. If you pick up any two or more of my seminars, I will send you free my character invention workshop. It's an hour long workshop that you will do at home. You can just pause as you go, do the exercises and activities, and then come back and resume the video. I guarantee you it's going to inform all kinds of new ways to sharpen and embolden your character work please check out that archive because during this period of downtime, 
the only way we are able to stay active here at the Wrestle Factory, keeping the bills paid and keeping the landlord away, is through the revenue we're bringing in through these archived seminars. And your support would mean a lot to me and everybody here at the Wrestle Factory as well. Check them out. 13 different options. I know one will interest you if you just take a look at what's over in the archive. I'm going to grab myself another drink of water, and in just a minute, I'll be back with more. Make sure to keep sending in your questions, suggestions, and topics through the chat. I'll see you in just a second.